Okay, thank you for joining today's webinar, Livestock Water. My name's Ian McFarland and I'm one of the Sheep Connect SA team. Today wouldn't come about without Sheep Connect being supported by Australian Wool Innovation and the South Australian Sheep Industry Fund. For more information on Sheep Connect, uh, please check out our website or follow us on Twitter at Sheep Connect SA. Our webinar on Livestock Water, we've got um, three speakers, Emma Shattuck, uh, Livestock Production Advisor with Elders. Emma's got um, a number of years experience working particularly in the northern half of South Australia and spends a lot of her time helping sheep and cattle producers improve the health and productivity of their stock, both through individual consultations and as a qualified presenter for a range of national programs, including the likes of lifetime new management. Our second speakers will be Andy Chambers from Airborne Logic and Nick Cummings from Atnic Solutions. Um, Andy and Nick will uh, provide a few details on um, their um, businesses and uh, they've got uh, a wide experience in environment, water and sustainable agricultural management. So with that, I'll um, start tonight's webinar and hand it over to Emma. Okay, so firstly, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to present tonight. I'm going to have a bit of a look through some of the factors that affect different um, intakes, I suppose, for particularly sheep and um, when we're talking water. So largely looking at quantity and quality. Okay, so firstly, we'll cover how much does a sheep actually need to drink um, and what changes that. And then we'll have a little bit of a look at water quality. What are we really looking for when we're looking at water quality or getting our water tested? And then finally, a little bit around the infrastructure side of it. So what's some of the better ways to set up our water systems? Okay, so I probably can't drive this message home enough that water really is the thing we should be considering above all else. So it's quite easy to get hung up on certain minerals or something smaller when we're talking about livestock production and managing sheep. Um, when quite often energy and protein should come before that and then water first and foremost. So water has the ability to both depress appetite as well as dry feed intake as well. So it's really important that we get that right before we do anything else. Okay, so how much does a sheep actually need to drink? Um, the answer you can see there varies a fair bit, anywhere from two litres a day right through to 12. Um, some of the factors that are going to impact this is anything that's getting pushed a bit harder. So your higher production rates, animals in a feedlot, um, ewes that are lactating and producing a lot of milk, they're going to have your higher water requirements. Weather certainly comes into it. So if we're talking summer versus winter, sheep are going to drink a lot more in summer. It is possible in winter on good green feed that they might get all of their water requirements from the feed alone. Um, but at the very least, they usually drink 40% more in summer than what they would in winter. Um, the, I've probably touched a little bit on feed quality there. The other thing is, and you see it particularly in a drought, when you're on a high fibre diet, that can also increase water, water intake. And at the same time, quite often can decrease how well stock will tolerate salt as well as they're getting weaker if feed is limiting. So there's plenty of things there. If they're walking further, they're going to need more. If they're on salty type feeds like salt bush or really salty supplements, they'll need to drink more as well. So can vary a fair bit depending on the situation. If we are doing water budgeting, it's also important that we account for that extra water that the stock aren't using, but is disappearing. So that whether that's kangaroos drinking out of a, tr uh, out of a trough, um, could be evaporation from dams and open tanks. It might be burst pipes, especially if you're on mains water. So there are also other places water goes when the stock aren't drinking it. So let's have a little bit of a look at quality. Um, above all else, the water needs to be palatable. 
if it tastes a bit funny, sheep certainly don't drink or at least won't drink as much. And they are quite sensitive to taste. So we do see this a bit, particularly in feedlot lambs, and they tend to drop grain and bits and pieces in troughs in the feedlot. And that can be just enough that they don't drink quite as much, which then means they often don't eat quite as much either because those high grain diets do heat them up a fair bit. Having cool water is quite important, especially on those hot summer days. So ways to manage this are varying pipes. Um, if you can, have your troughs somewhere shaded so that water isn't getting that hot or at least having a higher flow rate of water so that you've always got cool water coming through. Going back to the palatability, the more often you can clean the troughs, probably the better, depending on the situation, of course. So if you've got some of those classes of stock that are really are drinking a lot of water, it's quite important to keep those troughs as clean as you can. We don't want the water to have any funny smells or anything like that that might turn stock away. And ideally somewhere around that neutral pH. And the last point on there, which we quite often see on a water test is total dissolved solids. So it is highly correlated to salinity and usually, well, sometimes that's what we use as a measure of salinity, I suppose but you're looking at the dissolved ions in the waters as well as some of the organic acids as well. So that one is a really major driver for water intake. So we'll have a look a bit in a bit more detail. I've put up a range of livestock on here just to sort of highlight the differences, I suppose. Sheep are one of the most tolerant classes of livestock that we routinely deal with, especially compared to things like poultry, uh, which are very sensitive. So it can handle that bigger range of salinity. Um, as a rough rule of thumb, anything under 5,000 parts per million, you can usually get away with. Once you start to get over 10, things got, start getting really challenging. Um, and again, the type of sheep will depend a bit on what sort of water you can use. So whereas a dry ewe or a or a weather might be able to handle those high salinity rates, a young weaner that's trying to grow or use that are lactating really need the better quality water um, and struggle if they're on anything too salty. So um, for some people that's a bit of a tool to try and allocate some of the poorer water sources to some of the stock that can handle it a little bit better. So I think I've already mentioned this but I really want to make this point that salinity is the most important limiting quality factor. It really does drive water intake and then appetite. So really animals with a high salinity water will eat less and you can start getting some scouring. Um, it's essentially salt is acting as a toxin by that point. And you also end up with a uh, loss of microbes from the rumen. So that changes the osmotic pressure in the rumor increases it, which then has a faster or a higher outflow. So you're getting more water passed through the rumen and it washes more of those microbes out. So without them in there, we then, those animals aren't able to convert the feed as well. And you end up with a reduced feed conversion ratio as well. So it really does impact your production a fair bit when you're starting to deal with those high salt levels. While boards are a little more stable, surface water can vary a fair bit. So it might be as dams or surface area is evaporating and drying up, you start to notice it getting saltier. Sometimes rains can wash those salts out of rocks and the soils in creeks. And so you get a bit of a fluctuation mm -hmm. then. And of course, and probably um, a little better understood in irrigation areas is the changes in the water tables as well. That can start bringing water up to the surface or water into the water table that you're using to water your stock. What an animal can actually tolerate in terms of salinity will vary, um, not only with that class of stock like I mentioned before, but certainly the type of feed they're on. So if they're on a lush green pasture and there's plenty of water in that, they can probably handle a bit saltier water because they won't be drinking as much of it versus dry feed. Um, that hotter weather where they've got higher intakes they'll be a little more sensitive to it. And in terms of the diet, how much extra salt's in the diet from other sources. So 
animals grazing saltbush have a lower tolerance for salty water because they're already getting a fair salt intake in their diet. So lots of little things to consider like that when we're trying to work out, is that water going to be good enough for those classes of stock? Um, another perhaps more physical component is contamination in the water that we're trying to avoid. So we certainly don't want any um, debris or dead animals rotting away, sheep that got stuck in dams or something like that. You start to release not only toxins and odours and smells, which can turn stock off of water. Um, heavy metals is something to watch out for, um, which sometimes can come from cropping chemicals, but also the actual cropping chemicals themselves. So dams in areas in cropping paddocks that have been sprayed and things like that, you can end up with some contamination in those dams and the same from fertilizers as well. Um, probably another point I did wanna make is it's not a good idea to reuse chemical containers for stock water. Um, I have seen people have trouble in the past, even with uh, liquid nitrogen fertiliser, um, reuse that in a feedlot and manage to poison a heap of stock that way, just with the overload of nitrogen. So they are a lot more sensitive and sometimes just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not going to be harmful. Um, algae is the last one. So there's a lot of different types of algae. Sometimes it's just a deterrent. So animals are a little less likely to drink um, and then all the way up to things like blue green algae, which do release toxins, which can cause some severe damage in your dams as well. So trying to work out ways to reduce that algae growth as, and um, of course, keep the stock healthy. So a little bit on to infrastructure now. I did mention flow right before, and um, that's really important, especially when you're starting to get to those higher intakes. So in a feedlot situation, if we can get, we sort of aim for a lower volume of water, but with a higher flow rate, so that there's always cool, clean water coming through, and that helps keep the um, feed intake up on the in a paddock situation, it also becomes quite important, especially when you have big mobs. So some of those really big mobs on a hot day, they'll come into water in the morning. Um, the first few sheep get a drink, no worries. But if the flow rate isn't quite up to it, by the time that tail end of the mob come in for a drink, the trough could be empty and those, the rest of the mob has started to move back away to either graze or go and find some shade. So sometimes some of those sheep might go the whole day without getting a drink, um, which in turn means they're probably gonna eat a little bit less as well. So we're starting to get impacts there. In terms of troughs versus dams, um, probably a really big one with weaners. So you can run into trouble with them being able to find water or recognize what water sources is, particularly weaners coming from dams and then getting weaned onto troughs. So there's a bit of an education period that needs to happen there as well. So making sure they're getting pushed on to new water sources. Um, but for, certainly for stock in general, wanting them to be able to find that water. Loosely speaking, um, it's been observed that weaners do a little bit better on dams. But again, that's assuming those contaminations like your algae and um, dead animals and things like that are all taken into account and under control. When we're talking troughing, um, trough space, like how long do I need my trough is certainly a question I get asked. The rough rule of thumb for sheep is about 30 centimetres plus one and a half centimetres ahead. And that's with access to one side. So if you've got the trough out in the middle and the sheep can drink from both sides, you can certainly reduce that down. But that seems to be about the sweet spot where you've got enough room for enough of the mob to come up and have a drink at a time when you need them to. Okay, so in terms of watering points, um, when stock are on dry feed and are drinking at troughs a lot more, they quite often have about a 500 metre grazing radius from a trough. So what that means is that first 500 metre radius gets grazed pretty heavily and there'll be back corners of the paddock that may or may not have even been touched weather's been like and how much those stock need water. 
if you are in a situation where you've got dry feed um, and probably, you know, paddock that's over 100 hectares, it could be a good idea to have a second trough in there to try and not only encourage water intake, but also get a much more effective graze of your paddocks. So sometimes this is a permanent trough, sometimes it's a, por a portable one. So um, I've seen all sorts hooked up to old shuttles and of course the ones that have had bed joy or something like that in there or water, water tankers just parked out in the paddock with a trough hooked up to it. Um, in a pastoral setting, this radius, of course, spins out a little bit more. So it's a bit more like two and a half k's. They do tend to walk around a lot more and are prepared to move further away from water. Um, but again, on a bigger scale, it's worth taking that into mind. Where are your watering points relative to fences and how effectively are you actually using your feed? So let's put this a little bit into practice. I've done up a bit of a mock farm here. So we've got a few different size paddocks and the watering points there are those blue dots and then the shaded area, that's that 500 metre radius. So you can see for those smaller paddocks, didn't really matter where the trough went, they're all gonna get effectively grazed. Um, that 20 hectare one, because it's long and skinny, even with the trough at one end and it's a small paddock, there's still a part that might not be grazed as effectively as it could be right out to that 130 hectare paddock with the troughs in the corners. Um, they're that far apart. There's still a large part of the paddock there that we could be using a bit better. So for this farm, um, they're probably effectively grazing a bit under half of what they've got there. If we made a few modifications, we can actually bump that up to closer to 80%. So again, didn't make too many changes with those little paddocks. I've assumed this guy is a, does a bit of cropping as well. So he doesn't want his troughs in the middle of the paddock, which of course gets you that better radius. Um, so I've kept them on the fence line. I've added an extra trough in that 120 hectare paddock, which now we're grazing most of that paddock pretty effectively. Um, we've shifted a couple of troughs further down the fence line for that 20 hectare and 130 hectare, and then the second trough in that part, we've just moved out a little bit as well. So you can see the difference. I think all that is, is one extra trough from the other picture from there. Um, and we've changed how well we can graze that. So sometimes you're a little bit stuck with what you've got, but if there ever is an opportunity to run more pipelines or you've sunk in your bore or something like that, certainly take into account how well the animals are gonna be able to graze that. Um, so finally, and I think this will lead into the next speakers pretty well, is how do we manage our water if it isn't great quality? Um, I mentioned before, sometimes we allocate different stock to it. So uh, some producers with a really salty bore up the back end might run weathers and then at least they're using that part of the property. Feed type would depend as well. So trying to cut down on the extra sources of salt in the feed if they're on salty water but options for mixing water as well to try and shandy it down and make something that is a lot more user-friendly, I suppose. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, any questions, happy to answer. Thanks, Emma. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of questions and if people have got more, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. So uh, can you comment on the relationship between parts per million and milligrams per litre? which you mentioned earlier, I believe. I can, yep. So, um, oh, parts per million, sorry, and milligrams per litre? Yeah. Yep, yeah. yeah. so they are a direct conversion. So um, one for one, if that makes sense. Emma, was there um, an ideal flow rate for paddocks or um, containment feeding that you'd recommend yeah. for producers? Okay. Yep, and it does certainly vary between paddock and containment situations. So containment and feedlot, we really look for at least 21 litres per minute as a flow rate. When you're talking paddock situations, um, especially when there's less pressure on the troughs, it could be down towards three litres per minute, but that does vary a little bit depending on mob size as well. So smaller mobs, um, could be a little bit lower again if they're not drinking too much water.
So another one was around, are there any other salt ions other than sodium that are important? Ah, oh, right, yes. And I probably didn't touch on that well enough. When we're measuring those total dissolved solids um, or salinity, it is actually measuring all of those salt ions or a group of them rather than just straight sodium. So yeah, some of those salts in the feed, we are thinking more of just the straight standard sodium chloride, but certainly in the water when we're testing it, it's already taking into account some of those other, um, yeah, whether it's a magnesium salt or a calcium salt and things like that. Yep, okay. Um, are there any um, recommended treatments for algae in a dam? Yeah, good question. Um, there are, and it does vary a bit. So some people have spread out hay or straw on the top of the water to try and suppress algae growth, which is quite a slow solution. Um, there's additives, just thinking what they're called now, copper troll and something else that are specifically designed to kill algae. Anytime you're doing treatments like that, though, you do need to remove the stock from the water because as the algae breaks down, if it's something like blue-green algae, it will release toxins into the water. Um, for trough situations, your trough blocks are usually um, a copper sulfate or something like that. Just need to be a little bit careful of applications. Probably not so bad as a trough block in a trough, but when you're adding copper to dams and things like that, sheep are really sensitive to it. So if you put a bit too much in there, you do run the risk of killing a few sheep, which isn't an ideal situation. Okay, thanks. Um, and question around where can you get water tested and any idea what it might cost? Uh, yep, yep. So depending what you want to test for, the costs do vary. A straight water test itself. Uh, goodness, if any other speakers can think, like, let me know, but I think it might be around that. $60, $80. Um, there's a testing authority in Adelaide that will do it. Um, and that will be more your standard pH salinity levels. And then for other tests like your algae types and things like that, um, same lab, but yeah, different costs associated with some of those more specific tests. Okay, um, someone was uh, wondering whether you could um, talk about drainage around troughs for sheep feet issues. Oh, yeah, sure. Yep. And certainly something we really um, look at when we're setting up feedlots and confinement yards is making sure the water's draining out from the yards. Having a bit of a pad or having that trough somewhere up a bit higher that they're not standing in mud is certainly going to help. Um, there's a lot of those like foot abscess and things like that, that are bacterial born, which can happen from having sheep standing in wet, muddy conditions. So I guess have it on a little bit of a slope or have a bit of a pattern. So the trough, the water from the trough actually drains away from the trough rather than pulling around it. It's certainly gonna help with some of that as well. Okay. Thanks Emma, um, I think it's a bit that's about to all the questions for the time being. So if you do think of something, please put it in the Q&A and we'll fire it back to uh, Emma uh, at the end of the, uh, the webinar. So at this point, I'd just like to uh, hand it over to Andy and uh, Nick, um, who will be talking about um, water blending in particular. So all yours, uh, Andy, can you share your screen, please? Thank you, Ian, and good evening, everybody. Great to be here and having a chat in particular about uh, what we can do when we have differences in water qualities and in particular, perhaps sources that are particularly uh, salty and um, other sources of water that might be quite good uh, and whether there's a smart way to blend that water to get the best outcome. So. Uh, we'll just give you a little bit of background on who we are. So I'm Andy Chambers, um, the Managing Director at Airborne Logic, and I've got uh, Nick Cumming with me from Waterwise Automation. Say good day, Nick. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Nick Cumming here. Thanks for joining us. And what we're going to go through is uh, essentially uh, talking about uh, 
a, a combined project that Ken and I did for the Kurong Tatiara Lap uh, group around the Kurong, where we were dealing with very, very salty underground wedge hole water uh, and very expensive but good quality mains water. And so in an attempt to try and reduce some of the costs around in particular the mains water, we trialled some smart integration of technology and uh, also, I guess, internet type services to see whether we could actually effectively blend those sources of water and come up with a consistent water quality for uh, for stock water. So we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. Um, why did we sort of end up as being somewhat experts in this area? Um, well, I've got myself 30 odd years uh, of experience in water resource management and sustainability, uh, particularly uh, in rural areas. Uh, but more recently, we've been bringing together technology through uh, ag tech and uh, in particular use of drones and smart cameras like thermal and hyperspectral uh, to start having a look in more depth at what's going on with a range of different uh, agricultural issues, including uh, water. So uh, that's a bit of a picture of one of our, our big drones that we use and how we bring all of that together to really focus on things like reducing costs, uh, targeting water and fertiliser applications and uh, tracking and analysing change over time, uh, which is a whole different ball uh, game and a whole different uh, issue to what we're specifically talking about tonight in terms of water blending. Um, all of that's put together into sort of mapping uh, formats uh, to help identify a range of, of farm type problems. Um, but most of that focus is in around where can we save cost and money and most importantly, reduce time uh, around inspections and uh, helping people to get a better understanding of how technology can be used in depth on farms for, for benefit. So over to you, Nick. Yes, so uh, thanks, Andy. Um, my background uh, for many years has been primarily in automation in the manufacturing and, and mining uh, fields. Uh, and for the last uh, 20 years or so, have been uh, involved in the water industry to do with uh, commercial uh, irrigation control systems primarily. Um, I've also uh, been involved along the way there with uh, water treatment plants as far as doing control systems for them, uh, water treatment plants for human consumption, of which uh, the issue of blending different qualities of water came into practice. Uh, and so I have some uh, expertise in that in years gone by and hence uh, combined there with uh, Andy from Airborne Logic to uh, put together a system as he described where we can take water from two different sources with uh, two different levels of salinity and blend them together uh, on a continuous basis uh, where it's automatically controlled and monitored. Uh, to produce a desired result, which is, is monitored and measured and uh, uh, able to be uh, set to a preset value by the, uh, by the operator, by the, by the landowner. So, uh, and hence this project came about uh, to uh, do the blending down in uh, the water down in the Coorong. So. Thanks, Nick. So uh, just by way of a little bit of background and acknowledgement that uh, the project down at uh, the Coorong with the Coorong Tatiara Local Action Plan Group was uh, funded through state government as well and really was trying to focus on the fact that we had some pretty salty water. Uh, I forget the salinities now, Nick, but I think we were sort of I well over 12. Around the, yeah, yeah it was up to 12. 15, uh, 12, 13,000 parts per million yeah. or something, wasn't it? So, yeah, yeah, so getting pretty salty and well above those levels that Emma's described as being palatable for stock. Um, the other side of the coin was the fact that we were dealing with, at that time, very, very expensive SA mains water. So some of the landholders down there were dealing with $3.50 a kilolitre at that stage. And in some cases for the particular cattle properties involved, upwards of $100,000 in water costs for stock water, which was a real battle in terms of making ends meet. So the thought was, could we get in and somehow automate uh, a blending of those two sources of water? So that first of all, we were harnessing and utilizing the readily available, quite shallow uh, water table saline water. Uh, 
but being able to blend that automatically with the infeed from the SA Water Mains to give us an overall better uh, quality product. Well, not better than the mains water, of course, but better than the salty water uh, and reduce significantly some of the cost. So we got our heads together and uh, came up with a design that essentially looked at um, really bringing together a salinity probe, which is uh, the yellow uh, device you can see on the left of that image and uh, an automatic valve uh, being the blue uh, gate valve installed into the pipework here, uh, bringing those two sources into a central tank uh, and then enabling distribution uh, from that tank. Um, Nick can talk a little bit more about some of the automation equipment that we're looking at here uh, that was controlling uh, that process. Yeah, so certainly, so this was uh, out in an area away from uh, any available power, so it's obviously uh, solar powered, uh, the whole unit there, as you can see by the panels. Uh, it's using uh, off-the-shelf equipment, uh, PLCs uh, in that uh, cabinet there. Uh, which is standard, uh, you know, automation type equipment readily available, but it's been designed around doing this specific job. Uh, and in this case, we also uh, put in a 4G modem, which is visible in the box there, so that uh, we could monitor that from a remote location and uh, and track all the uh, uh, how the process was was going each day. So uh, the the touch screen there that's on the current slide. Uh, enables the uh, user to set whatever uh, EC uh, level he requires, the finished water. Uh, and so the automatic valve is blending, bringing the incoming fresh SA mains water in and blending it at the right ratio to produce um, the uh, end result that's required uh, as set on the screen. So. Uh, that's all trapped in the system to, to know, uh, you know, what quantity of water is flowing through there if that's required. Um, certainly, you know, can incorporate flow meters in there and flow quantity and everything. So, uh, which is obviously an important aspect to know what quantity of water is using as well as the uh, quality of the water. So, this can be monitored on a continuous basis uh, to ensure the system is working correctly. Um, and uh, obviously it becomes an issue uh, in this particular case, there was uh, two different solar powered uh, wedge holes that had solar powered pumps set up in them uh, that obviously only worked during the day, whereas the SA water was available 24 hours a day. Uh, and so this system catered for that where it would uh, shut down the SA water once the, the sun went down and the, and the water from the wedge holes stopped flowing. Uh, this would shut down the SA water, but there was a, uh, a built-in safety factor as well that if the, the tank got down to, uh, the main feed tank got down to 50%, then uh, it was deemed to be filled up purely with SA water. So the, the tank never uh, ran dry overnight. So, uh, but any of those uh, systems there, that's uh, one of the rigs there with the, Andy at a, at a show there and I'll, I'll um, let him talk about that. Thanks, Nick. So yeah, I might just jump back through to that previous slide as well and just mention that uh, whilst this particular trial was done for stock water for cattle, um, it's absolutely adaptable to use with uh, sheep livestock and the system's essentially the same, bringing in different feed stocks of water, uh, blending those through into a central tank. And then obviously from that central tank, there was delivery systems through to water troughs uh, around through the uh, controlled by standard sort of uh, float valves. Um, so we did a bit of a travelling road show uh, to give people an indication of what the sort of size and equipment uh, uh, and ability of that uh, type of kit was. So it's always important to get a bit of a feel of what the footprint was like for that. The previous slides you would have seen the pipework installed up against the water tanks. Here we've just taken them out uh, to give people an idea of what uh, the control box and solar panel look like from a size perspective. Uh, and I've got my left hand there on uh, just that simple pipework, uh, which really was just, a, as we said, a blending valve uh, 
uh, and uh, a salinity probe that was wired back into the control box to enable to give us that, uh, that sort of level of control. So we can see it here again. Um, this was again part of one of the, the, the traveling road shows out uh, on farm in a shearing shed. Uh, and you can see again, both valves there pretty easily installed on fairly standard irrigation type equipment um, and the control box uh, and solar panel. So I think that's one good example of uh, the type and approach uh, that we can use for blending particular water sources. I think it's probably just also worth mentioning a little bit uh, before we hop into this next little part of the, the presentation to talk about other technologies as well. Um, obviously in the case where there is only one source of water available uh, and that happens to be particularly salty, uh, then that type of blending approach that we've just described probably isn't going to be fit for purpose. It may be that you're looking more for perhaps a desal uh, type uh, uh, solution, which may come along with the need to store water, uh, wastewater and so forth. That's not the main intent of uh, tonight's presentation. And there's a range of so other things I, that I we guess, talk about. I guess, um, Andy, just to interrupt there, um, yep. you know, if, if there has been a, a desal plant installed, then uh, if it isn't already, there is possibly a need to be blending that desal water back with uh, some of the raw salty water, because uh, you don't want to be sort of feeding cattle with pure desalinated water. So rather uh, cost ineffective. So uh, that was my original um, part of the control system with water for human consumption. We didn't actually want it to uh, feed very uh, low EC water out into a you know domestic pipe system uh, because it's not good to drink pure desalinated water and it certainly does damage to uh, pipes and valves and everything else. So we were actually blending the salt water intentionally back in with the RO water to produce it at the correct uh, re uh, required salt content before it was distributed out uh, into the township. So. So the same may apply if a desal unit is put in for uh, stock watering. So, Thanks, Nick. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, and thanks for raising that. Absolutely. And I think we're just going to touch on some of those blending type solutions um, in other water supply type scenarios shortly. Um, one of the other technology features here, obviously, that uh, can come into play significantly is uh, water loss. Emma touched on that uh, in relation to leaks and so forth. Uh, some of what we covered in the same project uh, on the Coorong was using thermal imagery to have a look at uh, apparent leaks in pipes underground. Uh, and that's an example in the centre of that image where it was very evident that uh, through temperature that there was in fact a leak occurring on the ground that had been set up for that particular field day, uh, but was evident that uh, the thermal camera was able to pick it up. Um, so subsidiary type of technologies that can complement what we've been talking about uh, previously. Um, some of the aerial imagery looking at uh, things like dams and uh, contours to be able to better understand some of the fall and slope of lands uh, and particularly uh, storage volumes. Very easy these days with a drone to capture the volume of a storage in about uh, 20 minutes compared to older uh, surveying type techniques. Um, we'll come back to that later about some of the other things that uh, Airborne Logic's involved in, uh, but good to be talking about that, um, that blending process now. Uh, on the back of your comments earlier. Yes, okay. So that was actually a mimic screen you're showing there from a, uh, uh, a reverse osmosis plant there where we're uh, blending what's part of the control system, blending the uh, RO water, uh, desalinated water back in with the original raw water to produce the desired uh, output salt content. So, you know, and water for human consumption. So. Yeah, probably worth mentioning as well that uh, some of the solutions uh, that we dealt with uh, in the Coorong area with desalination also involved the storage of brine uh, in lined catchment storage for evaporation as a way to manage that brine. Um, that's a whole different uh, kettle of fish that we won't perhaps touch on too much more tonight, but uh, requirements uh, around EPA management of highly saline brine and so forth where there's difficulties in, in with display proposal uh, be an issue to deal with as well. Uh, Nick here, I think again, another good example of some of your desal kit. 
Uh, yes, yeah, that was one of the uh, desal plants there, and uh, there's actually the uh, blue valve right in the middle of the screen there is the blending valve, which is mixing the uh, pure RO water back in with the raw water to, uh, and the little yellow, the same yellow uh, EC meter would be visible uh, just to the right of that. So, so that's the, the three white cylinders of the actual RO membranes uh, with the uh, sand filters there on the right hand side and ultraviolet sterilization and as I say this this is for human consumption so uh, it's not contemplating you wouldn't be doing all this for uh, livestock but uh, some of the same principles in, uh, are involved in uh, blending different types of water. So. Nick, um, just in terms of, uh, I think, some of the issues that we encounter rurally around uh, transmission of data and information, uh, it may be a question that crops up uh, in question time on our presentation, uh, but particularly around dealing with uh, Telstra networks or, or other carrier providers where there is no network uh, and perhaps thinking a little bit more about radio control. Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, I at the moment sort of certainly uh, focus on commercial irrigation control systems of which I use uh, commercial uh, or mining grade radios to uh, produce my own radio network in the required area and these can transmit you know a single radio span can sort of easily go 20 kilometers and it and it means whatever network I develop around that uh, is independent of Telstra or 3G or anything else so um, there's no ongoing licensing issues with it, um, so you're not paying, you know, monthly fees on SIM cards or thing like that. Um, and this is actually one of the this particular town up in Queensland had four bore pumps that were feeding the main uh, desalination plant. So uh, there's actually this is one of the control panels, one of the bore pumps, and so that's uh, being fed back to the master control unit through a radio there, which is sitting on the right-hand side of that cabinet. So uh, I use that same uh, radio technology as I say for irrigation control and uh, it could be used in, uh, you know, stock watering situations if you're wanting to know flow rates and salinities and trough levels and anything else to do with that remotely out, out in a, uh, one of the paddocks somewhere. So. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Um... Ian, I think that's probably the majority of what we wanted to try and get across um, around the particular salinity blending uh, type approaches that we've had some experience around of late. I think there's a whole range of other stuff out there around uh, desal and fit for purpose uh, type solutions and so forth, but perhaps some of those uh, might come up in, in questions and we can answer uh, in a way that's gonna be meaningful for everyone as well. Okay, thanks Andy, thanks Nick. Um, yeah, just a couple of points of clarification. Uh, Nick, you mentioned PLC. Uh, PLC is a standard term for meaning programmable logic controller. So it's basically a, a small computer that's uh, industrially hardened. It's a, I'll call it a little black box that has wires going in and wires going out and the programmer develops some piece of software in the middle to do a specific job. So you can buy these things readily off the shelf and uh, every pump station and uh, electrical control stations, every, everything around, uh, anything to do with mining, industry, uh, manufacturing would all uh, exclusively use PLCs of one type or another to do their automation and control. So. Okay, thanks Nick. Um, um, another point of clarification was, again, um, we had a Millie Siemens um, figure there. So Emma talked about parts per million and milligrams per litre. And we um, were also then given uh, Millie Siemens. So just sort of wondering whether you could just clarify um, how that relates to the other two. Uh, yes, Andy, I think you looked up the exact figure yes, on that. We talked about this um, this afternoon. Was we it? did. So essentially, uh, we have a measurement called electrical conductivity. You'll often see that presented as deci siemens or micro siemens, really just uh, 
uh, a factor multiplication essentially. The key being is that uh, EC or electrical conductivity is a value substantially more than parts per million or milligrams per litre. It, it is roughly a 0.7 conversion or thereabouts. Uh, so I think at that uh, 5,000 uh, rate for milligrams per litre, we were up at uh, closer to sort of 6,000, weren't we, EC? Yes, yes, that's right. And, and the reason we're using that, the electrical conductivity, is because that's what the actual sensors that we're using measure. They're not doing a scientific analysis and working out the parts per million. They are purely measuring the electrical conductivity of the water. Uh, and, you know, predominantly, if you're trying to control for salt content, then it's going to be the, the sodium chloride that, you know, predominantly you're uh, controlling for or measuring, I suppose. So hence using that, bringing that uh, uh, unit into play there as, as micro siemens for electrical conductivity. Okay, thank you for that. So, um, now, a question around Coron lap trial. Any idea what the target salinity was? Yes, we did have, uh, yeah, yep, we I, had that on one of those screens, I think, didn't we? Yeah, I think we had that 3,500 yep. micro siemens. So. Yep. Um, and is it possible to give a, a bit of an indication of the, uh, the cost of um, that system? Yeah, overall, I think we were in the 15,000 uh, range for that full system, but it was constructed specifically for uh, that project, uh, essentially trying to buy everything individually off the shelf. And the feeling is that there'd be substantial savings on that in into a, uh, a wider commercial production uh, outcome uh, at scale. Um, so you wouldn't expect it to be as, as expensive as that uh, to, to roll out on farm to depending on the, on the needs. It was particularly scaled, I might add as well, to uh, look at the problem at hand with that particular trial property being uh, water costs upwards of $100,000, as I mentioned, uh, from an SA water perspective. Um, so we, we were really trying to match in with that uh, savings that would be significant enough to make it a, an attractive buyback uh, over a period of time as well. So uh, as always with business cases, we'd be trying to chase something in the order of three years Payback. And there was a question around, was the eight hour, hours enough to blend the water? Uh, yes, that was to do with the time that the uh, solar pumps are actually running. Uh, in reality, it's probably even a bit less than that. So um, I, I think that was uh, certainly one of the issues there. They were you know, using a lot of SA water there because they really couldn't uh, uh, the pumps weren't sized big enough to uh, pump during the the day uh, the hours of daylight, so they weren't really shifting as much as they should have uh, while the solar pumps were running. So it was particularly problematic uh, for that particular landowner uh, through a. Uh, this is two summers ago when we were hitting forty fives, and. Um, that that was difficult during that time period to make sure that uh, the flows all round were keeping up uh, across the property. And I think there was definitely a need to look at uh, some additional pressures and flows from the SA water uh, perspective as well. So it's probably worth mentioning some of the basic information that's needed at the property scale level before entering into these type of arrangements. And that is definitely to have a really good understanding of what your pressures and flows are like from individual sources of water so that they can be matched alongside of the type of equipment uh, and needs for daily flow rates. Okay, thanks for that, Andy. Um, just you know, I had one that came through to me oh, on text. Um, yeah. It's Jodie here. Um, Andy, if someone's starting out with a um, sanding operation, where do you suggest they start, I guess? And you've got a few key pointers for someone starting in this journey. Starting out with technology, I think, um, yes, I mean, there are plenty of uh, suppliers around with the type of equipment that uh, Nick has suggested in that it's generally available in the industry. I think one of the things that we really wanted to make sure was that we weren't using equipment that was hard to get hold of, that was freely available, that could be sourced from any number of uh, uh, irrigation type uh, supplies or technology supplies. 
Um, I've got to obviously put a plug in for Nick here and say as well that uh, having somebody with uh, Nick's industrial automation expertise is particularly useful in this type of uh, setup because uh, of the wealth of experience around radio networks connecting into cellular networks and so forth as well. So it sort of depends a little bit about what type of situation you have, what type of existing services you have available to you. If you're in marginal um, telecommunications areas, um, what type of water sources you have available to you. So uh, I think to come back to some of Emma's comments around the importance of water quality is always to really start off there and think about what have you actually got in terms of the supplies that you have available to you. So um, a simple pump test can help you uh, understand what sort of flow rates you've got, litres per second, um, hourly flow rates, get that water quality tested, absolutely. Um, the Australian Water Quality Centre, which is part of SA Water in, in Adelaide, uh, will take um, samples by mail um, and will give you that basic salinity and uh, cation, anion type uh, analyses of, of water quality as well. So uh, probably, I'm not sure Ian and uh, Jody, whether there's uh, services over on the Air Peninsula, for instance, with uh, Department of Ag, with uh, PERSA having um, salinity testing, basic salinity testing, any industrial lab would be able to also provide that uh, that type of water quality testing. Um, just to clarify on the, the radio network issue there, Andy, yep. Um, yep. there's no reason why that, that kit we use there has to have any radio connection. It's quite happy to run as a standalone thing out in the middle of a paddock somewhere. Um, it has local monitoring facilities on there, so uh, a farmer could go out and check it every couple of days um, if he, you know, without any uh, remote radio connection or anything like that. So um, the unit will operate autonomously by itself. So, um, but you know, as more and more people these days want to be able to see what's going on on their phone while they're sitting on the lounge in front of the TV. So all those sort of facilities are readily available as well. So. Okay, um, thanks very much um, Nick for that. Um, so, I'd just like to uh, thank everyone for uh, joining us for uh, today's webinar and in particular I'd like to thank Emma, Andy and Nick for uh, sharing their um, expertise and insight into the issues they've discussed. Um, I'd uh, encourage um, attendees just to uh, provide some feedback on the um, tonight's webinar um, and Certainly, if there's any other areas of water security you're interested in, please touch base with us um, and connect. So thank you again for your time and have a wonderful evening.